Number 11. Dolavira Stepwell. In 2014, news reports announced the alleged discovery of a 5,000-year-old stepwell in the Indus Valley city of Dolavira in present-day northwestern India. It's the largest ancient reservoir found in the country to date, measuring 240 feet, about 73 meters long, 96 feet, or 29.3 meters wide, and 33 feet, or about 10 meters, deep. The structure is nearly three times bigger than the Great Bath at Mohenjo-daro, in what is now Pakistan, which represents the earliest public water tank of the ancient world. At the time of the Dolavira Stepwell's discovery, researchers announced plans to continue investigating the site in hopes of studying water flow patterns, ancient water conservation efforts, and evidence of manufacturing that they found, including beads and semi-precious stones. Stepwells, which are ponds or wells with stairs descending into them, were used for both practical and religious purposes. They also served as monuments, with some bearing elaborate carvings. News of the Stepwell at Dolavira perplexed a officials from the Archaeological Survey of India, or ASI, who pointed out that the site was discovered roughly 15 years earlier and was not exactly news. Speaking with Scroll.in, archaeological engineer Vilas Jathoff further explained that just because a well has steps, it does not mean it's a step well. Experts conceded that the structure, which was built around 2500 BCE, is still impressive in its own right, but they contested the seemingly miscalculated claims by the media. Number 10. Roman military camp. Sometime during the 2nd century BCE, around 10,000 Roman soldiers built a sprawling 49 acre or 20 hectare acres military camp in what is now Melgaço, Portugal. The site, known as Lomba de Morda, served as a temporary fortification for soldiers who were crossing the Labrodiodo mountain between the Lima and Minho rivers. Used for short periods, sometimes just days or weeks, during the summer months, the camp was situated along a route that traversed high ground for safety reasons. Temporary accommodations like these are difficult to detect because they left behind little archaeological evidence and the Roman army often destroyed them before leaving. Researchers discovered Lomba de Mordo using remote sensing techniques. Until now, they knew of several mentionings and writing sources of Roman soldiers crossing through different valleys, but they didn't know exactly where this occurred. The site is the oldest known camp of its time in Galicia, in northern Portugal. Its exact age is unknown, but experts believe it may be linked to the campaign of Roman consul Decimus Unus Brutus in 137 BCE, a time when Rome was increasingly advancing on northwest Iberia. Number 9. Prehistoric Cabin A handful of carbonized bamboo fragments found in southwestern China's Sichuan province are from a Neolithic cabin dating back 4,500 years, according to archaeologists from the Chengdu Cultural Relics and Archaeological Research Institute. Discovered among the ruins of Baodun, ancient town, the artifacts represent the oldest known evidence of a bamboo mud-style building on the Chengdu plain. In addition to the structure, the team found tens of thousands of pottery pieces, dozens of stoneware fragments, and suspected rice paddy ruins. The items resemble objects found at nearby excavations of Sangshuindui sites, which came after Baodun was established. Based on these similarities between the artifacts, scientists believe that by further exploring Baodun, they can learn more about the mysterious Sangshuindui culture. The ruins at Baodun are the largest and earliest remains of a prehistoric town along the upper reach of the Yangtze River, as well as the earliest mass settlement site on the Chengdu Plain and the birthplace of rice cultivation in the region, CGTN reported. Sites like this challenge the long-held notion that the Yellow River Valley was the sole origin of ancient Chinese civilization. Number 8. Mystery Bronze Age Structure Since its discovery on a small hill in northern Italy in 2005, experts have been trying to figure out what a wooden structure, known as the Nocetto Vasca Votiva, was used for. Built sometime between 1600 and 1300 BCE, during the Late Bronze Age, the oak contraption is slightly larger than a backyard swimming pool, according to the Cornell Chronicle. Using dendrochronology, the practice of dating an object or event based on a tree's annual growth rings, and radiocarbon dating, a team of researchers from Cornell University 
recently determined that the structure's upper tank was built in 1432 BCE and that its lower tank was built in 1444 BCE. They pinpointed these dates with 95% certainty, allotting for a margin of error of four years. A newly published paper describes how the Nocheto Vasca Votiva was built during a time of major societal change in the region, which was characterized by fewer larger settlements, more specialized manufacturing, and changes in burial practices. Due to its location atop a hill, the structure was probably not used as a well or reservoir, and it contained a collection of artifacts that appear to have been deliberately deposited into it, including figurines, ceramic pottery, and stone and wood objects. The evidence indicates that it was likely used for a supernatural water ritual of some sort. Number 7. Bronze Age Homes Central Europe's largest early Bronze Age settlement, nicknamed the German Stonehenge, is located roughly 85 miles or 137 kilometers southwest of Berlin in Sachsen-Anhalt. More formally known as Ringheiligtum Pulmulta, the Neolithic site dates back to the late 3rd millennium BC and contains an arrangement of seven concentric wooden rings. Excavations at the site have turned up gruesome finds, including mutilated bodies of women and children, with some bearing evidence of severe head trauma and rib fractures from around the time they died. Researchers long believed that the site was used for seasonal sacrificial rituals and religious events, but recent excavations found a two-house dwelling, indicating that people may have lived at Ringhalishtum Pumulta. Archaeologists uncovered further signs of permanent habitation, including 20 ditches, numerous burials, and 80 complete house plans encompassing 130 dwellings. Most of the homes date back to around 2200 BCE, during the time of the Unyajetsa culture, but some are even older, originating around 2800 BCE and bearing the signs of the Bell Beaker culture. Archaeologists are continuing to explore this newly discovered residential zone in hopes of learning more about the Unyajetsa culture's social and religious customs. Number 6. Death Masks of Mycenae While excavating the ancient Greek city of Mycenae in 1876, German archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann discovered seven gold funerary masks that were placed on the faces of buried bodies. He was convinced that one of the masks belonged to King Agamemnon, a Mycenaean king mentioned in Homer's epic poem The Iliad. While the mask was ultimately dated to 400 years before Agamemnon's time, it's still famously known as Agamemnon's mask. Bearing the image of a man who appeared to have died around age 30, it stands out against the other masks, which are simple and lack specific features. Speaking with Xinhua news outlet, Konstantinos Pascadili, curator of antiquities at the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, explained that whoever the man was, he was considered royalty and was buried with full honors. And that all the recipients of the gold masks were important people. The masks are largely a mystery to this day, especially since the people who lived in the region were rather poor until around 1600 BCE, when they suddenly became extremely wealthy. Experts don't know how or why this happened, where the gold for the masks was sourced from, or where the Mycenaeans got the idea of covering the faces of their dead with gold. Number 5. Shamanic Snake Staff during recent excavations at a late Stone Age dig site northwest of Helsinki in southern Finland, a team of researchers discovered a 4,400-year-old wooden staff shaped like a snake. They believed that the Neolithic shaman may have used the 21-inch long or 53-centimeter stick for magic rituals, according to a new study. Carved from a single piece of wood, the piece depicts a long, slithering snake with an open mouth. The team that conducted the research believes that it may represent a grass snake or a European adder, but not everyone agrees. A researcher not involved in the study told Life Science that, in her opinion, the depiction more accurately represents a viper. She further added that the viper has historically played a significant role in folk religion and magic. The shaman who owned the stick likely used it for rituals and possibly for talking to the dead. The people who lived in the area believed that it contained a land of the dead, according to ART News, and snakes represented an intermediary of sorts between the real and spiritual world. This dig site was discovered by accident 
in the 1950s by a ditch-digging team, but excavations since then have been intermittent. Scientists believe the settlement was inhabited from 4000 BCE to 2000 BCE. Number 4. Roman Basilica Israel's largest known Roman-era basilica was just discovered in Tel Ashkelon National Park near the shore of the Mediterranean Sea. Founded by Herod the Great, the first century structure functioned as a public building where citizens carried out business transactions, met for social and legal reasons, and held performances and religious ceremonies, according to the Israel Antiquities Authority, or IAA. Measuring 360 feet, or 110 meters long, and 130 feet, or 40 meters wide, the building boasted a colonnade consisting of 40 feet, columns, and had a central space flanked by two side halls. Around 200 marble objects at the site were imported from Asia Minor during the 2nd century. In 363 AD, the basilica sustained heavy damage from an earthquake along the Dead Sea, and was abandoned. Some of the building's marble was repurposed centuries later under the Abbasid and Fatimid caliphates. In addition to the building itself, the team found coins dating back to Herod's rule, which lasted from 37 BCE to 4 BCE. This isn't the first time archaeologists unearthed the 2,000-year-old site. Back in the 1920s, British archaeologist John Garstang discovered and reburied the structure. Recent excavations began in 2008 and are ongoing, with the ultimate goal of restoring the site to its former glory. Number 3. 1,000 Year Old Egg Based on chicken egg fragments discovered throughout Israel, archaeologists know that poultry farming came to the region over two millennia ago. Recently, they found an incredibly rare intact egg while excavating a cesspit in the ancient city of Yavna. It was incredibly well preserved, owing to the oxygen-free human waste it sat in for around a thousand years. Staff members unfortunately managed to crack the egg while removing it, despite taking utmost precautions. Whoops. Most of its contents were lost, but part of the yolk was saved, and the researchers preserved it with plans to perform a DNA analysis. The crack was also repaired thanks to the director of the IAA's Organic Materials Conservation Laboratory. In addition to the egg, the team found three dolls made from bone, which were customary toys of the period, as well as an oil lamp unique to the late Abbasid period, which was used for dating the egg. Israel is also home to Maresha, one of the earliest known sites with evidence of chicken farming. The practice appears to have arrived there around 2300 years ago, after the conquest of Jerusalem by Alexander the Great. Number 2. Shark Attack Victim Roughly 3000 years ago, a man living in Japan was brutally attacked by a shark. He died with hundreds of injuries to his arms, legs, chest, and abdomen, and was buried at the Tsukumo site near Japan's Sato Inland Sea. Experts from the University of Oxford were baffled when they first examined his remains, wondering what could have possibly caused such horrific wounds. A thorough analysis of the injuries ruled out human conflict and more common animal predators and scavengers, leaving the team to conclude that a tiger shark or a white shark mauled the unfortunate individual to death. Based on the number of tooth marks on the skeleton, the attack likely lasted a while. Researcher Rick Schulting told CNN that evidence of shark attacks on humans is rare in the archaeological record, which makes sense, since there are only a handful of fatal shark attacks on humans throughout the world today. The mutilated remains represent the oldest known evidence of such an occurrence. Number 1. Europe's Oldest Wine Greece is one of Europe's oldest winemaking regions. The practice may have even originated there. According to a new study detailing the discovery of Europe's oldest wine near ancient Philippi in northern Greece, it was there, in a single house, that archaeologists found thousands of ancient grape seeds and ceramics containing equally old traces of wine. The evidence was preserved after a fire broke out around 4300 BCE and destroyed the home. Spanning roughly 11 acres or 4.5 hecta acres, the Delikitash site is a tell or a mound, which grew over thousands of years as humans repeatedly built over the site. Looming nearly 50 feet or about 15 meters above the surrounding area, the layers extend as far deep as 55 feet or about 17 meters below ground. Researchers only recently discovered and began excavating the lower levels at Delikitash, which contain evidence of the little-studied early and 
and Middle Neolithic people who lived there. The prehistoric wine was discovered among these layers and presents interesting questions about the role of alcohol in the ancient society's culture, and any problems they may have experienced due to alcohol consumption. Furthermore, archaeologists hope to learn more in general about the societies who occupied the site during these early periods, including their social and economic organization. Nine, the Flesheros. The Flesheros, whose name means arrow shooters, are an uncontacted tribe that lives in the Javari region of the Brazilian Amazon, near the Peruvian border. So little is known about them, even their language and exact ethnicity are mysteries. What we do know is that this group is extremely skilled with bows and poison arrows, hence their nickname, and some have learned the hard way that they don't hesitate to shoot at intruders. Journalist Scott Wallace is one of the very few people who've ever come face to face with the Flesheros. In 2002, he ventured into their territory with the noble goals of protecting the tribe and the resource-filled land. His mission involved assessing the group's health, which had to be done from a distance as to not transmit dangerous germs that the Flesheros have no natural resistance or immunity to. Sadly, the Brazilian government has scaled back on its funding for protecting its uncontacted tribes over recent years leaving groups like the Flecheros increasingly vulnerable to the outside world. In 2017, a group of gold miners who had just finished an illegal job in the Amazon bragged while out at a bar about how they murdered 10 Flecheros members they encountered in the rainforest. As if bragging about murder wasn't enough, the killers had tools and other personal effects they had taken from the slain bodies as trophies to prove their story was true. Pretty terrible if you ask us. The horrific ordeal drew widespread criticism against the Brazilian government for slashing its budget on protecting the vulnerable indigenous groups. Many suspect that these needless killings happen more often than anyone realizes, since they tend to occur in extremely remote regions, far from the scrutiny of mainstream society or law enforcement. 8. The Korowai The Korowai, also called the Kolufo, are a small group of around 3,000 to 4,000 people who live in the Indonesian province of Papua, near the Papua New Guinea border. They were supposedly completely unaware of the outside world's existence until anthropologists sought them out during the 1970s, according to the Daily Telegraph. This group of hunter-gatherers is one of the only known untouched tribes to practice cannibalism, although this custom may be declining due to outside intervention and mixed feelings within the tribe. Traditional beliefs held that when a man is overtaken by a witch's power, in a state known as Kakua, the only way to expel the unwelcome presence is to kill and eat its host. Thank goodness we don't have to do that when we get sick. The Kurawai people do smoke tobacco, but they don't drink alcohol, and typically do not live past middle age due to their lack of medical knowledge. Men usually have several wives, and leadership is based on the personal qualities of influential individuals called big men. Contact between the Karawai and outsiders is fairly common, although some communities are largely unaware of the world beyond their homeland and are known for being hostile towards unfamiliar people. Karawai communities have also been known to feud with one another. The further one ventures into the rainforest, the more likely they are to come across a Karawai village that has had little exposure to any culture other than its own, according to Paul Raffaele, who interacted with the tribe firsthand in 2006. Writing for Smithsonian Magazine, Raffaele argued that the Karawai have no more than one generation left of their traditional culture, as young men and women become increasingly assimilated with mainstream society. It's sad to lose out on a traditional culture, even if they do practice cannibalism. But this seems to be a growing trend amongst the tribe. 7. Nomole Also known as the Cuyareño people and Nomole, the Mashkopito are a tribe of nomadic hunter-gatherers who live in Manu National Park in the Madre de Dios region of southeastern Peru. Found in some of the most remote parts of the Amazon, they actively avoid contact with non-indigenous people. The term Mashkopito translates to savage in the pure language and is considered to be insulting. Instead, the group calls themselves the Namole. 
they speak a dialect of the Piro language and live in a community of raised wooden homes deep in the rainforest, where they craft spears out of bamboo reeds and ferment fruit into alcohol. The group's population dwindled after rubber industry kingpin Carlos Ferven Fitzcarald hired a private army to slaughter the Namoli in 1984. By 1976, the tribe's numbers hit an all-time low of somewhere between 20 and 100. In 1998, the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs estimated the Namoli population at somewhere between 100 and 250. Today, the group is thought to number somewhere between 600 and 800, with the numbers continuing to grow. In recent years, the Namoli have increasingly interacted with the outside world, Experts speculate that a food shortage could be to blame, but nobody really knows why the tribe is finally emerging from isolation. Despite their occasional willingness to engage with non-indigenous people, the Namole will not hesitate to attack or kill someone they perceive as a threat. The Peruvian government discourages contact between the Namole and outsiders, but also has its own plan in place to pursue what's known as controlled contact. Meanwhile, activists are campaigning for the authorities and everyone else to leave the Namole alone entirely. What do you think? Should outsiders leave the Namole alone? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. 6. The Protected Sentinelese North Sentinel Island is part of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands archipelago located in India's Bay of Bengal. It's home to an indigenous tribe called the Sentinelese, who experts know very little about due to their long-established history of violently rejecting contact with the outside world. For thousands of years, the tribe has lived in near-complete isolation, speaking a language that nobody else in the world knows. The Sentinelese have attacked or killed nearly everyone who has tried approaching them. They're so hostile, authorities have even decided against trying to retrieve the bodies of slain outsiders to avoid further violence. Nobody knows why these Sentinelese are so quick to attack, although a good guess is that they simply want to be left alone. But their self-imposed seclusion benefits them because they have no natural immunity or resistance to a handful of modern diseases and sicknesses. Most people are able to survive them, but they could easily kill tribe members. In 1956, the Indian government implemented legislation banning visitors from going within five nautical miles of Andaman Island for their safety and ours. Only a select handful of professionals have been allowed there since, including Indian anthropologist Trilkanath Pandit, whose team established the first and only peaceful interaction with the Sentinelese in 1991. Some people have ignored the ban against visiting Andaman Island, with deadly consequences. The most recent case happened in 2018 when a 26-year-old American Christian missionary named John Chow paid fishermen to illegally ferry him to the island. Chow knew the dangers associated with going near the Sentinelese, but he was so intent on spreading Christianity to the tribe even though he didn't know the language and they certainly didn't speak English, he still went anyway. He tried multiple times to get to shore on a kayak, but he was only met with arrows every time. Eventually, the men who ferried the missionary saw the Sentinelese dragging Chow's lifeless body. The fishermen who helped Chow reach the off-limits island were arrested and charged for their crimes. But the Indian government did not prosecute the Sentinelese for killing invaders. Considering all that is known about the tribe, the answer to avoiding a volatile encounter is simple follow the law and stay away from their island. 5. The Hidden Awa The Awa people of Brazil live deep in the Amazon basin, numbering no more than 350. They are considered to be the world's most threatened indigenous group, with at least 100 of those 350 members having had no contact with the outside world. The Awa lived in small settlements until the early 19th century, when they were forced to become nomadic in order to escape European attackers and encroachers. During that time, the invaders removed most of the forest of the Awa's territory. Although some of the Awa moved on to government-established settlements during the 1980s, most continued to live in nomadic extended family groups, numbering only a few dozen members. The Brazilian government implemented measures to protect the Awa in 1982, 
due to some increased violence with local settlers who were also destroying the tribe's land. Writing for Vanity Fair, Alex Shumatov explains that the Awa people are smaller in stature than your typical human, which is believed to be an adaptation to life in the jungle, enabling tribe members to traverse the rugged terrain and dense vegetation with ease compared to the average sized person. Families go on extended hunting and gathering trips that can last several weeks. They also have been documented keeping primates as pets. The tribe stays as invisible as possible to the outside world as a way to protect themselves from being pushed out of their territory. Members of this elusive group are rarely seen. In fact, they're so good at remaining hidden. Some people have even questioned whether they still actually exist. Footage of an Awa tribesman that was captured in 2019 by a neighboring tribe proves that this tribe is very much real. But as deforestation continues, NGOs like Survival International are working to protect uncontacted tribes and fight for rights of indigenous people. 4. Taramenane There are only two remaining indigenous groups in Ecuador that we know of who purposefully remain isolated from the outside world. One of them is called the Taramenane, which has an estimated 150 to 300 members left and is located in the Yasuni National Park. The Taramenane live as nomads in a distinctly inhospitable part of the jungle. They don't wear clothes, and they speak a language unlike any other, according to a Newsweek article by Dolores Ochoa. Little else is known about the lifestyle, culture, and customs, because the tribe adamantly rejects contact with outsiders to protect themselves. Illegal logging and oil development within the jungle threaten this shrinking population. And the Ecuadorian government's failure to protect the tribe amounts to an uncertain future for the Taramanane at best. A plan to stop oil drilling in the group's territory failed to secure the necessary funding and was scrapped in 2013. There are even unfortunate rumors that some loggers, along with other workers, are known to kill tribe members. Several indigenous groups in Yasuni National Park have been decimated by disease brought on by increased proximity with outsiders, according to Survival International. This could easily happen to the Taramenane too, who have no natural resistance or immunity to diseases from outside their small territory. 3. Piripkura There are only two known living members left of the Piripkura tribe in west-central Brazil's Mato Grosso state. They are an uncle and nephew named Pakye and Tamandua, and they live a nomadic lifestyle, striving to maintain their separation from the rest of society at all costs. Illegal loggers slaughtered most of the 20 members of the Piripkura tribe during the 1980s, and protection didn't come to the group until 2008, when the Brazilian government demarcated a parcel of land in the Amazon specifically for Pakye and Tamandua. The pair consciously chose to continue living in isolation from the rest of the world, demonstrating their resilience and their dedication to their way of life, even after their fellow tribe members were brutally killed. A 2017 documentary called Pirip Kura follows the researchers from FUNAI, the Brazilian government agency tasked with protecting indigenous rights, on their mission to prove that the two men are still alive. Paki and Tamandua willingly approached the filmmakers after a torch they'd been burning for 18 years went out. Funai workers performed some medical exams on the men, relit their torch, and then parted ways. Since then, activist efforts have focused on protecting the pair through legislation, designating a parcel of land just for them. 2. Chimbu Skeleton Dancers In the central highlands of Papua New Guinea, there is a little-known tribe called the Chimbu. Their first known interaction with outsiders happened when Australian explorers encountered the group in 1934. The Chimbu are unique for the dances they perform, dressed as skeletons, to scare enemy tribes. This tradition was developed with the idea that their enemies would not perceive them as human and would believe the dancers have supernatural powers. Very little is known about this extremely remote and isolated group who live in rugged mountain valleys. Traditionally, men live separately from women and children in dispersed settlements, but the Chimbu are starting to live as family units, Violet Johnson wrote for The Guardian. Their houses are oval or rectangular and are made from flattened reeds with dirt floors and thatched roofs. As the skeleton dancers attract tourists, the tribe has started reforming for the public rather than strictly ritualistic reasons. But the rest of their culture and customs remain, for the most part, a mystery. 
1. Ayo Reo The Ayo Reo indigenous people's territory straddles the border between Paraguay and Bolivia. Numbering around 5,000, they're divided into subgroups that are rumored to sometimes be hostile towards one another and to outsiders. But this small society of hardy survivors has more reasons to fear the rest of the world than we have to fear them. Historically, the Ayo Reo were hunter-gatherers. Today, some live and work on Mennonite cattle ranches for very little pay. Sadly, the society's lifestyle and culture have been severely disrupted in a very short time by people wanting to develop their land. One subgroup, the Totobiego Sode, had minimal contact with others until they were forcibly resettled during the 1970s and 80s. As a result, many died from illness and malnutrition. Today's Ayureo communities largely lack modern conveniences like electricity, medical care, and clean water. Diseases like malaria and tuberculosis are common. Moreover, the group's housing is ramshackle and they often encounter violence from non ayureo people. The Ayureo are also entangled in an ongoing fight for recognition of the land ownership amid rampant deforestation of the Chaco forest that they call home. As ranchers encroach on the land, indigenous communities in the region face imminent threats to their survival. In 2019, the Ayureo secured a landmark victory when they received ownership documents for nearly 44,500 acres of their ancestral territory. This does not necessarily mark the end of the group's fight for the rights, but it marks a tremendous step forward in their quest for recognition and protection. Number 10. Dead Dragon? In August 2016, footage of an alleged dragon falling from the sky in Tibet made headlines on social media, sending netizens all over the world into a frenzy. The footage, which supposedly depicts the dead dragon on a beach after it plummeted to Earth, received over a million and a half views within three days of being posted online. While some of the more skeptical, savvy people who witnessed the video decided to go on fact-checking missions, others simply chose to believe that it was real. Thankfully for all of us, Snopes, a popular fact-checking site, was on the case and quickly debunked the claims that the footage showed a real dragon. The site found that the creature shown in the video is a dragon sculpture created for a Spanish television show, which investigates conspiracy theories, cryptozoology, and mythical creatures. The faux dragon was used in a scene for a phony documentary, much like other similar broadcasts that focus on popular myths like Bigfoot, mermaids, and even ones that claim the Megalodon still exists. It's not surprising that the show capitalized on people's desire to believe fabled creatures are out there. After all, viewers eat this stuff up. But the plain and simple truth is that the dragon was fake. Don't be disappointed though. As you'll see throughout today's video, our planet was once chock full of animals that once actually existed and were so huge, strange, and fierce, it's hard to believe they're not fictional. Number 9. Frog-Faced Turtle Between 72 and 66 million years ago, during the late Cretaceous period, a toothless, frog-like ancient turtle with poorly developed upper and lower jaws lived in what is now the island nation of Madagascar. As a suction-type feeder, the species ate a smaller-bodied living prey. And guess what? They ate them whole, taking no time at all to chew their food. Paleontologist Dr. David Krauss described the prehistoric creature as a stunning example of evolution in isolation. For over 20 million years, the species evolved on Madagascar. A fossilized specimen discovered in 2015 in the northern region of the country is considered the best preserved late Cretaceous turtle among the southern continents, according to Krauss. In a place known for its unique wildlife due to its isolation from the rest of the planet, the fossil shows how the animals who lived on Madagascar tens of millions of years ago were already very distinct from creatures in other parts of the world. The discovery also sheds light on a phenomenon called convergent evolution, which happens when different animals independently evolve similar traits in order to adapt to their surroundings. Number 8. Arctic Dinosaurs Around 70 million years ago, the world was much warmer than it is now. 
but places like Alaska still experienced below freezing temperatures and snowy winters. For this reason, scientists developed a tendency to overlook the possibility that dinosaurs lived in these environments year-round. But experts recently proved themselves wrong when they discovered the fossils of seven dinosaur species as much as 250 miles or about 400 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, challenging the long-held belief that all dinosaurs were cold-blooded. This is the furthest north that scientists have ever found dinosaur eggs, and their presence suggests that the creatures overwintered in the Arctic. The prehistoric creatures must have been warm-blooded to some degree, in other words, capable of at least partially warming their bodies via internal functions. In order to survive month-long periods of darkness and extreme cold, according to the lead study author Pat Druckenmiller. Discoveries like this are helping scientists realize how little we truly know about the dinosaurs and how much we have left to learn. Number 7. Ancient Burrowing Mammals Around 120 years ago in now what is northeastern China, there lived two distantly related ancestors of modern-day mammals, who are also the earliest known scratch diggers. In the phenomenon known as convergent evolution, which we discussed earlier, these burrowing creatures independently evolved similar traits to support their lifestyles while living in the ancient Jehol Biota ecosystem. Originating from the mammaliform group that today's mammals evolved from, the newly described species lived between 145 million and 100 million years ago, during the early Cretaceous period. Armed with specialized traits for digging, they had a short tail, short limbs, and strong forelimbs with well-developed hands. Out of the two species discovered, one is based on a foot-long, about 30.5 cm species with an elongated spine made up of 38 vertebrae, 12 more than the 26 vertebrae that modern mammals typically have. The other specimen is around 7 inches or 18 centimeters long and is a distant cousin of modern placental mammals and marsupials known as a Eutriconodontin. It had 26 vertebrae, also making it longer than most mammals. Scientists believe that a genetic mutation that occurs during embryonic development is responsible for the animal's elongated spines. This is known to happen in some modern-day mammals too, including elephants, manatees, and hyraxes. Hey, real quick, if you're new to the channel, welcome! If you're liking this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you haven't already. Number 6. Monkey Dactyl In what may very well be the oldest known documented case of a creature with opposable thumbs, scientists recently identified an animal nicknamed the Monkey Dactyl, which sounds a bit like the flying monkeys from Wizard of Oz. This pterosaur was described based on 160 million year old fossilized evidence that was discovered in a forest in modern day Liaoning, China. This small bodied creature boasted a wingspan of approximately 33 and a half inches or about 85 centimeters, and it may have been especially adept at climbing and grasping objects, as well as living high up in the trees. Researchers based these findings on 3D imaging, X-ray technology, along with comparisons to other pterosaurs. Simply put, the monkey dactyl had the right build for its suspected lifestyle and habits. These traits would have proven big advantages for the ancient animal by reducing its competition with other species. Not all experts agree with the findings. Speaking with Gizmodo, paleontologist Kevin Padian pointed out that having opposable thumbs is not a guaranteed indicator of tree-dwelling species, citing the example that raccoons have this trait but are not arboreal. Moreover, Padian said that the specimen is too poorly preserved to know for sure if it had opposable thumbs, and that a better preserved fossil might procure more definitive answers. But for now, it is interesting to think about ancient flying monkeys ruling the prehistoric treetops. Number 5. Lystrosaurus When the supercontinent Pangaea still existed around 270 million years ago, a particular-looking dog-sized creature known as the Lystrosaurus evolved into existence. Resembling a pig-lizard hybrid, this tusked, burrowing animal was armed with powerful front legs and a snub-nosed face, according to National Geographic. In addition to having a unique appearance, the Lystrosaurus was one of the very few life forms to survive the worst mass extinctions that ever occurred on the planet. 
caused by a massive volcanic eruption in what is now Siberia. The eruption lasted for a millennium and released copious amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. The event saw a cooling period followed by an intense greenhouse effect along with the acidification of the world's oceans. Hailing from a group of mammal-like reptiles called therapsids, which eventually evolved into mammals, Lystrosaurus owes its survival at least partially to its ability to spend extended periods of time underground. It was also capable of acquiring enough oxygen from the heavily contaminated air thanks to its robust lungs. These advantages enabled the creature to go on living even after 95% of the Earth's wildlife died out. Lystrosaurus fossils have been found in Africa, China, and Antarctica, lending credibility to the belief that, at one time, the continents were connected. These goofy-looking animals travel great distances over land, and it appears as though they fled south when the volcano erupted in a bid to get as far away from it as possible. And they didn't merely live through the mass extinction. They flourished throughout the catastrophe and its recovery. A 2020 study on the creature's tusks found that hibernation likely played a crucial role in the survival of the Lystrosaurus. After migrating to Antarctica, the creature had to adapt to annual month-long periods of isolated darkness. Its ability to survive via hibernation spared it from having to head back up north towards the volcano, where the environment was far deadlier and less hospitable. Researchers haven't proven that the Lystrosaurus hibernated, but if their suspicions are correct, then this is the world's oldest known case of a backboned animal or a vertebrate hibernating. Number 4. New Saber-Toothed Cat Species North America was once home to one of the largest big cats that ever lived, according to recent research identifying a newly discovered saber-toothed cat species. The massive cat roamed the continent between 9 and 5 million years ago, hunting rhinos and bison. A graduate student rediscovered the animal's huge arm bone several years ago at the University of Oregon's Museum of Natural and Cultural History. Experts were stumped regarding what species it belonged to, and a years-long effort to solve the mystery ensued. Throughout the process, the team collected seven previously uncategorized fossil specimens, which they used to describe the new species. This cat was closely related to the Smilodon, an ancient saber-toothed species that also once roamed throughout North America. But the new species was much larger, weighing up to 900 pounds or more than 400 kilograms. And it routinely killed prey that weighed as much as 6,000 pounds or about 2,700 kilograms. During the study, the researchers discovered numerous bones belonging to the species in collections throughout the continent. With the largest leg bone they found measuring 18 inches or about 45 centimeters long. To give you an idea of just how big this cat was, a modern adult male lion's humerus is around 5 inches or about 12 and a half centimeters shorter, measuring 13 inches or 33 centimeters long on average. This landmark study is just one piece of a larger, far more complicated puzzle and scientists are continuing to work on disentangling the confusing evolution of saber-toothed cats and how they're related to one another. Number 3. Paraceratherium The prehistoric world was full of creatures who could dwarf today's largest animals, including modern elephants and giraffes. Among them was the largest mammal that ever lived, a massive rhinoceros called the Paraceratherium. The extinct genus encompassed six species that lived throughout what is now Asia, between 23 and 32 million years ago, with the largest specimens measuring over 20 feet, a little over 6 meters tall at the shoulder, and weighing more than 20 tons, or 18 metric tons. The animal was roughly 26 feet, about 8 meters long from head to tail, and its head alone measured around 4.3 feet, or 1.3 meters long. These gargantuan rhinos were hornless predecessors of modern rhinoceroses, who developed horns much later on in the evolutionary timeline. They dwarfed today's rhinos, elephants, and even the massive woolly mammoths that roamed the Earth during the last ice age. According to scientists, Paraceratherium was one of the last remaining giants to walk the Earth. It outlived other mega-animals amid climate change, resulting in a drier atmosphere during the Oligocene Epoch. A recent study describes a newly discovered Paraceratherium species, 
based on remains of these prehistoric beasts found in northwestern China's Gansu province back in 2015. The new species was not the largest of them all, but it was nevertheless gigantic, especially by modern standards. Number 2. Adolotherium The Adolotherium, or crazy beast, is a prehistoric mammal that lived alongside the dinosaurs around 66 million years ago on the supercontinent Gondwana. Fossils of the creatures, also known as Gondwanatherians, have been found in modern-day Argentina, India, Africa, Antarctica, and Madagascar. Once mistakenly thought to be an ancestor of modern-day sloths, Gondwanatherians are now known to have been a separate, failed evolutionary experiment that led to their eventual extinction around 45 million years ago, according to lead study author and vertebrate paleontologist Dr. David Krauss. Based on the fossilized skeleton of the species Adolotherium hui, which was found in northern Madagascar, experts estimated that the creature weighed less than 7 pounds, or about 3.2 kilograms, making it around the same size as a modern house cat. While this may seem small, a hui was much larger than other mammals that existed at the time. It somewhat resembled a modern badger, which would make it pretty typical by today's standards, but the animal was an anomaly of the prehistoric world. Adolotherium hui was equipped with a more sensitive snout than any other known mammal, which had a large hole on the top unlike anything ever seen in other animals. It had extra vertebrae, a strangely curved leg bone, and teeth that were unique to the species. The study reveals that A. Hui developed its bizarre features over a 20 million year period after Madagascar broke off from Gondwana, leading to notable differences between the species and mainland Gondwanatherians. Number 1. Godzilla Shark Nine years after it was discovered in New Mexico's Manzano Mountains, a 300 million year old fossil famously known as the Godzilla Shark finally received its scientific name. Dubbed Hoffman's Dragon Shark, the 6.7 foot long or about 2 meter creature is named for its 12 rows of sharp teeth and its 2.5 foot or about 77 centimeter fin spines. The name also hails from the family who owns the land its fossil was discovered on. Today, the Manzano Mountains are in one of the country's driest regions, but sea levels were much higher back during the Godzilla shark's existence, when modern-day New Mexico was submerged beneath a seaway that extended into North America. The species likely dwelled in shallow waters where it fed on crustaceans and fish, according to scientists. It had much shorter teeth than modern sharks, measuring roughly 0.8 inches or about 2 centimeters long. The shark's chompers were better suited for grasping and crushing prey rather than piercing their targets, according to John Paul Hodney, the graduate student who discovered the fossil back in 2013. The specimen represents one of the most complete fossilized skeletons ever found among its evolutionary branch, which split from the modern shark lineage around 390 million years ago, according to the Associated Press. It's believed that the Godzilla shark went extinct roughly 60 million years later. We're definitely glad something as terrifying as this is no longer lurking in the ocean. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to learn more about fascinating prehistoric creatures, let me know in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe. I'll see you next time.